We're live? We are live. We are live. Okay. Um, so we're broadcasting this like we always do. And uh, welcome to Cake, everyone. Um, just to, uh, I guess, yeah, as we always do, uh, tell a little bit about what we're about before we start. Um, Cake is uh, started up the first of the year, and basically we're really about providing um, down and dirty, actually useful techniques to improve your business. And we're doing it one topic at a time, week by week. Um, we meet every Wednesday. And all of this is uh, live streamed and then archived online, so you can access it. Um, we're totally donation-based. Um, we don't charge for anything. Um, so if you haven't already, feel free to toss in some ducats over here or um, online. You can also just click the PayPal donate button. And um, gosh, what week number is this 30. for us now? Number 30 is uh, we've been doing this, yeah, um, which is awesome. And um, today we're going to be talking a little bit about customer service, which uh, is something that it was actually really hard to find bad advice on, which is interesting, uh, as opposed to a lot of the other topics, like um, how to design things, or how to write an ad, or things like that, where you go and look for advice online, and you just find all sorts of terrible things where you never want to trust them. Uh, and this one, it's actually really easy to find a lot of um, decent customer service advice. Um, but what I will say is there's a lot of things that I feel like we as human beings um, sort of instinctively or intuitively think about things or just go towards and uh, certain pitfalls that we end up in. Um, and I want to bring up some of those and talk about uh, ways that we can actually more acutely even improve our customer service. And uh, there will be some basic stuff in here too. The goal is to kind of cover the full gamut of, uh, of subject matter here. So a lot of the stuff will be things that are pretty obvious, like the customer is usually right. Uh, but you'll also find things like maybe you should fire your customers and tell them to not come back to your business. Um, in the talk as well. Um, just a little background, I guess, on why I feel like um, this one especially is a really good subject for m me to talk on, is that I'm really obsessed with customer service. Um, and running Float On has been a great exercise in that as well. Um, even looking back through our um, Yelp reviews or anything like that, reading about them, you see all kinds of ridiculous. Usually they're like, place was clean, flow was awesome, customer service was absolutely amazing. Um, we've had people say that we were the best customer service in Portland. Um, we've done things like uh, someone got a flat tire outside of our shop and we uh, watched their kids and went and got gas for them <laughs> uh, to replace it. Uh, things like that. Um, people really love it. And I think that at its core, what customer service really comes down to is just saying like we're all human beings and we're all in this together. And the more you treat it like that, the better it gets. And the more you actually try to act like a business or think that you need some kind of customer service policy or get into acting like, uh, I don't know, just kind of corporate-y, um, the worse it gets, almost hands down. And the more rules you introduce, actually, the, uh, the worse that it gets in my mind as well, the more actual customer service policies. And we'll get into to why that is. Um, I think another reason that it's really easy to find good customer service advice out there right now is that there's been a like customer service renaissance recently, um, probably within the last about three to five years, um, depending on when you kind of like hop on board. Uh, Zappos was a huge part of that. Um, they've done some excellent, uh, if you ever want to just look into a, a company that does customer service really well, slash brought it sort of to the tech industry, especially Zappos is really good. A lot of call centers are moving out of India, actually to Oregon, uh, which is crazy because apparently they, um, as some study said that Oregonians were uh, one of the friendliest people <laughs> in the United States. Um, and just really easy to talk to and get along with, yeah. Um, which is why we have so many call centers here, which is really crazy. Um, so Oregon is actually like, yeah, the migration from India. I have a lot of businesses who are like, oh, we need good customer service. Um, but I think what happened was we started automating things more and more. And it's kind of the same cycle you see um, in a lot of things. Like I was just talking about this last week with advertising. Um, but you see the cycle of we, uh, we have something where it's like, oh, you own a shop back in like the 1500s and you have customers and you need to talk to them and provide some kind of service to them and hopefully they're happy and come back. Um, and most of the time you just had like one shop in a town so they had to go back there if they wanted whatever your service was. And then you get more and more um, shops in bigger and bigger cities and you need more customer service. And um, somewhere around like the industrial revolution and a little after that we got obsessed with um, automation and with efficiency and with being cogs in a machine. And at some point along there, we turned customer service into another cog in that machine. Um, and Derek and I were just talking about this on the car ride over there, um, over here, about uh, scripts and uh, call scripts and customer service scripts and things like that. And um, it, it literally is. It's just replacing a human being with a cog in a machine. It's saying, like, this is something, like, I wish that I could train a, a computer to talk like a human being and have affect because I would much rather have that than you working here. Like, I just wanted to follow this script. Um, which is preposterous. And uh, I think that 
we've been realizing recently that what human beings have to offer that's much greater than computer programs, and maybe after we kind of figured out the automation a little bit more succinctly and what, what was the downfalls and the strengths, um, we realized that creativity and the ability to just react in the moment and to actually have complex problem solving skills is what human beings are great at. And uh, customer service has started taking advantage of that as well, just in terms of uh, what people offer and how we deal with customers and how we deal with complaints and um, giving, um, especially in bigger companies, giving employees the uh, leeway and the authority to be able to handle that on their own and really like uh, excel at it rather than just follow some prescribed uh, bare minimum script to make sure that they don't like sue you. Um, so I've kind of divided uh, this talk into five different categories, um, which are pretty arbitrary, except that I made just a ton of notes on customer service, and this seems to be the five categories that I could fit all of them into. Um, and they go in a sort of order, but not really. Um, so we'll start with the broadest one, which is um, I titled Be Magically Human, uh, which I think is honestly the most important. Like I think if you ignore it, everything else and just follow the basic rule of be a human being, then your customer service would already just pretty much like eh, be just fine. Um, Along with that, though, there's some things that go along. So magically human, uh, by that I mean that we need to not be a human being in the sense that we're um, uh, emotional and temperamental and that we respond to these human emotions. Like, we need to be a more perfect version of human, like a more empathetic uh, human, if you will. Uh, so part of that, uh, we'll start at the beginning. Like, well before you ever get to complaints or um, customer service comes the things that you don't do. Uh, so not making sales promises that you can't keep uh, is a huge one. In fact, um, even if you're not sure if you can keep it, like telling someone that or just not telling them and surprising them with something awesome down the road when it turns out to be something that you added on is way better. Um, promises that you can't keep or things that you think that you can get done that you end up not having enough time for and then you drop the ball or saying you'll email someone tonight but you actually email them tomorrow morning. Uh, these are the root of, I think, most customer service problems. Um, and it starts with just this sense of uh, what you can get done. and. Uh, <laughs> it's very dangerous. It's very dangerous. Um, I say, you know, it's kind of like the old advice of, um, uh, you know, promise small and act big kind of thing. Um, realize that people aren't out there trying to screw you uh, is another really big one, um, especially when people are trying to return your product or there's something wrong. Because um, from your perspective, that's what, like, especially from the business perspective, that's what's happening is like something has gone wrong and Lord knows it's not with your product, so it must be with him. Um, and just kind of like coming from the frame of mind, at the very least, they're frustrated. And um, if they are frustrated, and even if your product is acting perfectly and they like read the instructions wrong or something, it's probably still your fault for not designing the instructions well enough that they could follow it in the first place. Um, and people really aren't out to like try and just steal your money. They're not complaining because they actually liked your uh, product and they want their money back anyway because they just don't want to spend the money on it. Um, and I guess that just requires a little leap of faith, and that's that whole human being part as well, like understanding that these are other human beings out there too, they're not machines that are set on this like screw your business mentality, where they just like trudge forward, like taking advantage of everything they can, like it's very rare that you run into someone like that. I'm reminded of like high school Graham eating half of my fries at McDonald's and knocking them off the table because I found out they had a policy that they uh, would replace all fries as long as they were half or more eaten. And I just did that for about two hours until they just gave me a giant bucket of fries and told me to leave. Um, <laughs> right, so occasionally like high schoolers are actually out to screw your business. <laughs> but that's rare, that's rare. It's rare that you find a high school Graham. Um, be, be absurdly nice and reasonable. Um, that pretty much speaks for itself, like absurdly, I mean it, like actually just go above and beyond. We'll, we'll go and tackle that one down a little further. Um, that goes into like the extra mile category that I put down here. Um, being honest with someone, um, like never be afraid, and this is a, lo a lot of this first category too, is a lot of stuff that you'll hear from um, standard generic customer service advice, but it's still very true and very important. Um, be willing to admit A, that you're wrong, B, that you don't know a question, um, and see that you'll like look into it and make it right and like learn whatever it is is necessary to continue on from there. Um, you have a lot of luck with that. Like when people ask you, ask you something, especially if it's in your field of expertise and you really feel like you should know the answer to this question, it's so much better to just be like, I don't know, uh, but I will look into it for you. Um, or if someone says, can you do this? And you're like, no, I can't, but I will learn how and I'll get back to you in a week. And like from then on, I'll do that for every other customer as well. Um, and that ends up working out really well. Um, once again, it's that human thing. Like, if you don't know it, like, people will find out when they go and try to implement your advice and it doesn't work, that you actually did not know it and we're just bullshitting them. Um, so I guess the other part of that is actually knowing your stuff. 
Um, recommend your competitors uh, is the last one that I put in that category. And that's another standard one um, that you'll find a lot. But it once again, it like, ties into that base human instinct of we really don't want to do that, I think, lots of times. Um, at least I don't. Like, I, I fortunately have just ingrained it into my, person, like, into my business being that I will do that if I can't help them or if there's something where I actually think someone else could do it better or whatever it is. Um, recommending competitors is um, is great, and honestly, it's like a it's a really strong move, and it just tells people like I'm awesome. I care more about what you're doing and what your needs are than I care about taking your money. And I guarantee, even if they never come back as customers, if you do find someone who you are better suited to them, your competitor will probably recommend you. Um, especially if they're the kind of competitor who you'd recommend. I mean, comp competition is even like the wrong word. Like another business who does a similar thing is a better way to put that. Um, and the customers, too, will recommend you as well. Um, just because it seems to say, like, I know my stuff enough to know when I can't handle it, uh, which ends up being really important as well. Um, and it just develops really good goodwill, and it makes you feel good and, like, sleep well at night. A lot of these things, too, are just advice not only on how to make your customers happy, but, like, how to sleep really well at night and feel good about things. Um, and uh, so the next one goes into listen to complaints. And before we get into that category, because that's kind of a big one, um, just another couple words on customer service in general. So I feel like a lot of customer service actually just gets tied up in complaint management and in um, handling things that go wrong, uh, like either catastrophes or complaints. And uh, and that's terrible. And like if that's, I think I wrote it right here on this worksheet. Yeah, if you think customer service is all about handling complaints and catastrophes, then it's no wonder you have complaints and catastrophes. Um, which is true, like it's, uh, yeah, if you're always trying, it's like a Western prevented or uh, Western medicine is so like we deal with symptoms that come up instead of anything preventative as well. Um, and that culture carries over into business. Um, yeah, a ton, it's ridiculous. Um, so that's my little disclaimer on, uh, on complaints. And also that a lot of this, um, so uh, Yelp, Right, other review sites. We have uh, we have neighborhood notes uh, sitting right here in town as well. Everyone moderated by humans. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, which is awesome, and um, more than ever too. I mean, there's a ton of um, a ton of other sites that uh, are popping up all over the place. I mean, Google Places has reviews. Um, TripAdvisor. Those are all things that um, Float On takes advantage of. But uh, more than ever, I guess there's. Um, this community voice, and it's the thing that we can take advantage of. It's the reason we don't have to pay a lot for advertising um, anymore. And by, by a lot, I don't mean a lot of money. I mean, we often do not have to pay for advertising at all. And it's because this recommendation engine is in place. And even without those sites, we have things like Facebook, and we have just open-ended blogs where people talk about their experiences. Um, the best customer service exposure Zappos ever got was just a random blog post from a woman. Um, talking about their amazing service. And uh, you've probably heard this story, but I'll tell it anyway because it's awesome. Which was uh, a woman uh, had bought like 12 pairs of shoes from Zappos and uh, turns out that she didn't want any of them and didn't really have money. And the reason she didn't have money was because her mom had died. Um, and that was very tragic. Uh, but it had passed the due date for the shoes. Uh, and so she called Zappos, customer service, to say, hey, I don't want these and I know it's past her due date, but maybe I can return them. And um, I believe it was the next day, maybe a couple days later, um, a truck shows up to take away all of the shoes um, for free and return them, uh, no questions asked. And uh, also she gets a giant basket of flowers uh, from Zappos, just like saying that they're really sorry for her loss, um, which is amazing. And no one would have known about that except the customer in any other age and like their immediate circle of friends who they told. Um, and I'm sure they've done that a ton with other people too, Zappos has, and still no one knows about it because they didn't happen to be bloggers, but this one did. And she posted up on her blog and it made it just all over the freaking business blogosphere saying like, Zappos has amazing customer service, look at this story, this is outrageous. Um, and things like that really can spread and people have a voice now more than ever. Um, which means I say, like with everything I guess, uh, that the middle ground is the most dangerous place to be. Um, so people are going to, like, if your service is bad, that's one thing. And we're getting into the complaint region. Um, and we'll talk about how to handle those. Um, but that, that's also things that people will post up on Yelp and on Facebook and on Reddit and on their blogs and everywhere. Um, they will not post up if you'd had middling customer service. If all you do is, uh, is kind of satisfy what was making them angry and make them not angry anymore, that's great. And you've stopped that angry post or that angry one-star Yelp review. Um, but there's really an opportunity here, too, which is uh, you can be 
absolutely incredible. Like you can be amazing and go well above and beyond and just do absurd things for people and it'll actually pay off in a big way. Like you'll get exposure like as though you had paid for a giant full page newspaper uh, ad, which is thousands of dollars just from a few minutes spent on customer service. And, uh, and it doesn't happen every time. So you can't just do this as a one-off and say, okay, I'm gonna provide customer service to this one person and they're gonna vlog about it and I will get this return on investment. It's, it's more of a, a gradual snowball effect, um, but it does happen. Um, if you look at our reviews for Float On, um, they're just absurd. Uh, like we're number 11 ranked on TripAdvisor right now. Um, and it's pretty much strictly because of our incredible customer service. Uh, so that said, listen to complaints, do listen to them um, and really listen to them too. Um, make sure to, and this is just classic listening advice in general, I have a psych background, so this is uh, standard for me, but repeat back to them what they said uh, as the problem is a really big one, because it shows that you actually understand, just saying like, oh, I get it, <laughs> does not show that you understand anything. Um, repeat it back to them in words that aren't their own is another part of that. Rephrase it and repeat it, uh, and that does a lot. Um, immediately apologize, too, is what I say. Um, at the very least, even if you think that it is completely their fault and that you or your company had nothing to do with it, you can apologize for the fact that they're frustrated. You can always apologize for that. I'm sorry that this has caused you frustration. And you should be. <laughs> I mean, legitimately, like, whether or not it was, like, whoever's fault it was, that is something you can always toss out there. Um, and, uh, let's see. Realize? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um... Same thing with arguing with a customer, like you should have done this, or you should have done that, or if you'd done this differently, we wouldn't be having this conversation to begin with. Just don't do it, don't do it, never. <laughs> it's not, it's never a discussion worth having. Like, even if you know that it's their fault, just pretend that it's your fault. And if it's required to admit that they did something wrong to fix the fact that it's going wrong. Um, I really like, uh, one of the, my favorite things I came across in just researching this talk, actually, uh, was uh, the blow dust out of it analogy that someone, I think it's actually Joel Spolsky, um, if anyone here knows him. Um, but he was posting up on uh, customer service with uh, uh, tech support and do things like tech support for modems and tell people, oh, like, uh, you know, can you just try unplugging that and plugging it back in? Or like, you know, can you check to make sure that it's plugged in in the first place? Like, are you sure you plugged it in? And people get angry at him. And they're like, yes, I know that it's plugged in. Yes, I tried unplugging it and plugging it back in. That's the first thing I did. Um, what he realized was that no, they hadn't. And in fact, the, oh, I'm fine, yeah. Um, that was the, uh, like, <laughs> it would delay him for like 10 minutes trying to figure out what was going wrong. And eventually they'd get back to the fact that the modem was not in fact plugged in. Uh, and so what he started doing instead of that was, oh, you know, sometimes we get a little dust that builds up on these power cords inside. Can you just like try pulling, pull that out and blow the dust off of it and plug it back in? Uh, and of course what they found when they do that is, oh, uh, maybe it wasn't plugged in to begin with. Uh, and so, you know, these phone conversations he said switched from, no, of course it's plugged into, uh, oh yeah, that fixed it, that fixed it, it must have been the dust. <laughs> um, and, yeah, which is just great. Uh, so that's another good thing, which is ma make sure that there's a way that they can not be fallible, um, even if they are, is a good way to work that in there. Um, and the overall, I guess, uh, thesis of, of this part is that the goal should be to really make them happier that coming away from this complaint than they would have been even if they'd done the purchase to begin with. Like if they'd had the purchase with no problems at all, uh, the fact that they had a problem and called you should make them now even more stoked on your company. And the reason is that they're spending unnecessary time. Like it actually makes sense in an exchange sense. Like they've already given you money for your service or your product and now they're having to spend more of their own time to fix something or to take care of something. Uh, which means you need to give them something else back that is more than just fixing, you know, than making it so that nothing like neutral, I guess. You need to give them an extra bonus to make up for that extra time. Uh, and yeah, your goal should really be to thrill them, not only with the customer service, but with whatever they get afterwards. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit too with the set up your front line and follow up categories. So uh, providing a way to get feedback is also crucial for this, um, not just for complaints, but for other things. Because a lot of people, um, even me, I'll go home and be like, I'm going to send a letter to that company, and I never do. And I just kind of go home and, like, I don't know, end up hanging out and, like, having a beer <laughs> instead. Um, and I'm like, oh, maybe I wasn't that upset about it. Um, but people do have things that are going wrong. You won't get a lot of those until you reach this climax point. And the reason for that is a lot of the reason I also hate the middle ground, which is you have 
Uh, if you look at reviews on Yelp for businesses, they, uh, they go in a giant trough. And almost any review site, you see they will. Um, there are more one star and five star reviews, pretty much, than there are anything else. And then it goes to like two and four, and then down to three. Um, the reason is if you just have a mediocre experience somewhere, you don't feel like talking about it. Like, oh, everything was okay. <laughs> like you rarely have like this emotional urge to get that out of your system. Uh, if something is going awesome, you're like, yes, like, absolutely. I want to like show the world how awesome this company is. And even more so when something is going absolutely terrible, you definitely want to tell them because you're furious and pissed off. But that's when, like, the, at that point, the problem is already so great that you've re like, really started angering customers. Um, so providing a way to get feedback early on ends up being super important, uh, just for making sure you don't get to that critical mass point or that uh, critical anger point, I guess. Um, if you catch them when they're at, like, a three and they tell you why they weren't at a five, then you can start fixing things before you get down to that one category, basically. Um, and that can look like anything. Um, the, best, uh, the best schema I've seen for any sort of website optimization uh, was just a little text box at the bottom that said, like, how can we improve this page? So, like, having problems? And they just started taking everyone's advice, and that ends up being a great way to improve almost anything. Uh, and the key to that was it was at the bottom of every single page. It wasn't buried inside a little help link, or it wasn't buried inside a contact us, inside a, you know, here's how we can fix our website. Every single page just had that written directly on there. How can we improve this? Um, of course, now that's become standard practice. So if you want to implement this yourself, don't say, how can we improve this? Figure out some clever way that'll actually engage them and get them to give feedback, because they're so used to seeing a how can we improve this button uh, that it's yeah, shouting at deaf ears. Um, it can be, so we started uh, putting out, when we first launched Float On, um, we put out a, um, some crayons and a drawing book as our feedback book. Um, and uh, we actually just stopped that when we realized, um, A, that we got to talk to our customers very often afterwards, and they just kind of tell us what was going on, um, what the things that they loved and the things they didn't like, um, just in conversation, which is really nice. Uh, and also, the book, they would just start drawing pictures. We ended up with a book just full of drawings um, afterwards, which was good feedback, I guess, but not actually useful in that sort of sense. Um, but it can be something as simple as that, and I think the more casually you make it, the more open people are going to be. And the one thing I'd say is um, having an anonymous source uh, of feedback is also really important, because some people just don't feel comfortable talking about things. Um, and the last thing I'll say on listening to complaints is consider firing your bad customers. Um, and it depends on the type of business that you run. Uh, but uh, this got a lot of publicity recently. Uh, and by recently, I mean like two or three years ago. Um, I think it was... Sprint, maybe, um, or AT&T, uh, fired the 5% worst customers they had, um, in the sense that these were people who had the uh, lowest paying plans and took up um, 20 or more hours of customer support time a month. Uh, yeah, which was maybe it was in like the lowest 2% or something. It was ridiculous. They were just like on the phone, um, taking up all of this time that the business had to pay for, and eventually they realized like they, it was actually, it was literally just costing them more money to have these customers than to not have them. Um, and so they booted them. And they sent out a letter to all of them, and they canceled their contracts in like three months, you know, and said like, okay, your contract's going to terminate, you'll have to find a new cell phone service, <laughs> so, like, we're, we're just firing you basically. Uh, which angers a few people, but in the grand scheme of things, it also lets you provide that much better customer service for everyone else. Um, and there are people who really are just complainers, and when you get to a business that is big enough, like AT&T, where you have millions of users, firing the worst people of your customers can actually do a lot to improve the lives of all the rest of them. Um, you have to be careful about how you do it. They got a lot of flack for different parts of that, uh, but they also got a lot of praise just for taking that step and for realizing that like, there's no reason they should let some of their customers actually pull down the quality for the other customers. Um, so something to consider. Um, going the extra mile. Uh, this is the biggest thing, I think, uh, which is making that experience awesome, getting that five-star review as opposed to that three-star one that never gets posted. Um, you know, watching someone's kids and going to get gas for their car that got a flat tire out in front of your shop. Um, just giving full refunds for like the smallest complaints. Uh, things like that really transfer well. Um, anything that you can do. We um, ended up going over to tea for, at one of our customers' houses and helped them like lift a bird bath up on the shoes like this nice, uh, I don't know, how old, like a nice old lady who's pretty much the flip face grandma. And like, yeah, helped her set up her like bird feeder and stuff like that, um, which is great. And uh, that just turns into more and more stories. Um, <clears throat> so 
there's a few things with going the extra mile, though, um, that I would like to point out, other than just like, okay, go out and be awesome, because uh, that's really bad advice. Uh, so reward your loyal customers, not just your new ones, um, is a huge part of it. And this is one of those human instinct things that uh, seems really contrary. Like, we see a lot of um, sign-up bonuses on things, like uh, cable TV is a perfect example of people who need to reward their regular customers rather than just their new ones. Um, but you see a lot of sign-up bonuses, or a lot of like 50% off for your first time, or a lot of things like that. And it's interesting because you have these customers that are actually spending a good deal of money with you and on your business and loyal customers. And they're so loyal and they've been coming back for so often, you don't think you need to earn their, their stewardship anymore. Or their whatever the reverse of that is, I guess. And um, I think that that's just logically kind of false. Um, it seems to me that the more that people have supported you from the beginning, and the more that you haven't had to chase after them, the more resources you should have to reward them because they've cost you very little in the way of your attention or your time. Um, and it seems to me that the best customers that you have really are anyway, the ones who you should be saying like, yes, like thank you for being here. And it sends the right message to your other customers, which is if they've been there for years as well, like this is what happens. You know, if a new customer is signing up and they see an old customer getting some kind of free computer or a pass to a movie or a, you know, whatever it is, even just like a personal dinner or an invitation to coffee, uh, they notice that and they say, oh, this is the kind of business I'm signing on board for. Like if I stay here long enough, maybe I'll get one of these little benefits. And they will. And that's the good thing. You know, you're not like tricking people into that. It's like, no, we actually do just reward our loyal customers. If you are one, we will reward you. Um, spending an extra five minutes on, uh, on your work uh, after you've done it for each customer is a big one. This one I picked up from a blog post way back in the day. I don't even know where I stumbled across it, but it was a bicycle uh, repairman who, after he finished whatever the repair job was for each bicycle he was going through, um, he literally just spent five minutes doing something else, like something else to nicify the bike, whether it was like oiling everything or maybe he'd like, yeah, tear out a single brake cable and like line it back in because he's a bike repairman and can do that in five minutes. Um, and people would notice and he'd be like, oh, I just did this thing too that you didn't even ask for and I didn't charge you for. And that extra five minutes ends up really paying off over time. Um, and that just alone, like five minutes is kind of nothing in the course of a day. And if you have those kind of, like if you're doing, you know, thousands of transactions a day, then figure out how to make your automation for that. Like if you're doing online sales, figure out how to make the automation add in that extra five minutes for you or something that you know your customers will like. Um, and I think that's really rare. I think more often we have enough customers in a single day that we really can actually pay attention to them. And that five extra minutes really does make that difference. Um, the worst thing, in my mind, that you can do is something begrudgingly. Like, if you're going to give a refund to a customer and you have to do it begrudgingly and you're like, okay, I guess we can refund that money to you for this movie that you hated, that's terrible. <laughs> like, if you're going to refund the money anyway, like, at least be happy about it and say, you know what, I totally understand and you know what we're going to do? We're going to give you all of your money back. Something like that is incredibly better. If you already know what your policies are, skip the annoyance part and just go straight to the nicest thing that you can do to them. Um, and that's another one of those being magically human parts. It's like, go past the, like, those negative human cycles, and those reactions that we get, and you know that like, this is going to cost your business, you know, however much, like 100 extra dollars that you thought you were pulling in, now you have to refund. Like, but you have to refund it. You do have to refund that in certain circumstances. So be really happy about it and be chipper and be really glad that you can do that for them. Um, Free stuff makes people happy. Um, it doesn't even have to be your free stuff. You can give them like free food at other restaurants. Uh, you can do small little add-ons. You can, uh, like I said, just take them out to coffee. But free stuff does make people happy. And most of all, um, if you end up in a really big snafu, offering them a free your product or your service or your replacement, your product or your service, um, without having to go through some crazy form to fill it out, like instantaneously being able to offer that means the problem is solved and they weren't spending money on any of it. And that almost always handles um, people's uh, reactions to things. Um, unexpected rewards, too, is another thing on the, uh, on the opposite side of that. So um, free stuff makes people happy. And we think of that a lot in terms of complaints, like someone had something wrong, and so we're going to comp their service. But free stuff makes your regular customers happy, too. Sometimes it's nice to just send out free things to people who, once again, I say send it out to your best customers. Um, send, or send it out to the people who you just had a good conversation with one day and you really clicked with. Uh, but giving someone something extra, even if it's, yeah, just a coffee, or even if it's um, a letter or an email, uh, that costs nothing. 
and ends up being really meaningful to some people and just shows that you actually cared and that you were paying attention that you weren't just talking to them to try and get another buck out of them. It's like, hey, just to let you know, blah, 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 whatever it is that you want to say. Um, so that's what I mean when I say to go the extra mile, to qualify that a little more, more than just be outstanding or be amazing. Uh, and the last thing I'll say for that is it's not always possible to go the extra mile. Like, we run businesses. It's crazy. You barely have enough time in the day anyway. But I think every once in a while, regardless, just go balls to the walls for one of your customers and do something outrageous for them. Um, and it makes you feel really good. Like, take extra time to, like, if you ship out um, an internet product every single day, take extra time for one of the packages to, like, hand paint it and write out a little personal note saying you're, like, the business owner and you just really hope they get this and let you know if there's anything wrong. And you just, like, package it up really nice, you know, send it off. And it feels awesome. And you know that they're going to love that. Um, so even if we are totally swamped or totally um, um, pounded for time, um, Every once in a while, just do something outrageous. Well, those, what I, I find that it's um, really just saying yes in my mind to those, uh, those inner monologues or conversations I have where I say, wouldn't it be awesome if I did, like, wouldn't it be awesome if someone just was able to? And usually we're just like, yeah, that'd be awesome. And every once in a while, yeah, follow up with that. Um, setting up your front line uh, is another one of my big categories. And by that, I mean mainly the people who are going to be interacting with your customers, um, whether it's, uh, and not even necessarily the people. Um, it can even be copy on your website. Whatever it is that the customer really is going to be interacting with, you need to make sure to establish and set up properly to make sure that this customer feedback loop is actually going well. So uh, this is where you really get, I think, into interesting business decisions, too. So apologies if people don't have employees, because I think this is really where you get into the cool setup. Uh, so enabling people on the front lines to have authority and make their own judgment calls um, ends up being critical for this. Um, I find, actually, that the more policies you set and the more rules you put in place, the less likely you are to have good customer service. And it's because you're assuming that people's complaints are the same. Like, by trying to prescribe the same solution or the same thing that you say after every checkout or anything like that, what you're really saying is your business, your, like, your business and my business is the same as everyone else's. I am a cog in a machine, and you are a cog in our money-making machine that is this business, which is no good. Um, and so how do we enable people on the front lines to have authority and make judgment calls? Uh, I find a really easy way is to just lay out a set amount of money that they can spend to fix a problem, uh, or a set amount of procedures, saying, um, like, so for instance, at FloatOn, um, our first step whenever anyone has any complaint about a float is to offer them half off um, their next float uh, to have them come back in. And if that doesn't seem to make them happy, then we just offer to give them a totally new free float. And if that doesn't happen, then we offer to comp the float that they just had. And if that doesn't happen, then I think it goes into comp a float plus a new free float in the future just so they can come back and try it out again, but we rarely get to that point. Um, we also just have uh, a budget of $10 a week that people can spend on customers. Is that what it is? I thought it was uh, $5 a day. $5 a day? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that we, can, that we can spend uh, just making the customer happy. Uh, if there's something that you think needs to be purchased from the 7-Eleven next door to our shop where the customer's like, oh, I really wish I had some gum when I got out of my float, our employees can go do that for them and just get them gum and they don't even have to ask us for permission. They can just write that down that's covered in our policies. Um, so the more you set up good, uh, good systems like that where you have, I guess the, the rules that you have in place should really be what people are allowed to do not what they're not allowed to do. Like, yes, you are allowed to give out free floats. Yes, you're allowed to give out half-out floats. Yes, you're allowed to just spend money on customers for no reason and buy them things. Um, treating your employees well, too, makes a big difference. If your employees are unhappy to be there, like, your customers are going to be unhappy to have them as employees. Um, and if they're happy to be there, I think they really do a lot to want to support the ethos of the company, especially if you're saying, my company values customer service. Uh, your employees should really embody that as well. And the more they believe in your company and actually believe in what you're saying, the more they'll work to do that. Um, it's amazing how much people, when they trust you, really want to uphold that uh, and really want your company to have this good face name and they'll do things that you didn't even realize were possible with customer service. Um, there's a lot of basic stuff I wrote down in here too. Um, Immediate answers. People are always stoked whenever you get back to them really quick, uh, which is funny. I don't know. That's written almost everywhere in every customer service book you'll ever read. Uh, but it's really true. The faster you get back to people, like if I answer really complex emails within like five minutes of them being sent, people are like absolutely amazed. 
Um, especially, you know, being the owner of a business, if you're still running the customer service side of things, um, even more so, like the owner of the business got back to me in like five minutes. What is going on here? Um, and they love it. They love it. Um, answering phone calls. There's like a, there's a policy that got set up at some point in some call center for answering phone calls in one ring. Um, I can't remember where off the top of my head, but since then it's just been adopted as a really good standard practice. It's like phone calls should be answered in one ring. Um, emails should be answered within like three hours. Uh, which is great. I mean, if you can manage it, I honestly, like, and most of the time when you read through an email, you're like, oh, I'll handle this later. Um, I say just either you have a customer service person whose job it is to answer things as fast as possible, or when you get emails, I just answer them in reverse order. So at least, like, two or three people are going to think that I answered them super fast. Like, maybe I check my email every six hours during the day or something like that. Um, so, <laughs> like, whoever's at the first point of that six-hour mark is going to get an immediate response and it just kind of works backwards from there. But six hours, even if you're on the tail end, it still isn't bad. So that's a good way without even changing um, how you run things to still get that really nice idea of immediate response. Um, In-person help as opposed to automation uh, costs more, but the more you can do it, the better. Um, the other float space who runs the most floats uh, in the country right now uh, has one person who works on staff with them and they introduce people to the float tanks via a um, introduction video uh, that people watch ahead of time, um, which is really interesting and is definitely a really uh, much more uh, profitable way to run it than having two people staffed at all times and doing all of the room introductions um, in person and having someone actually show everyone through all the steps. Um, but that's exactly what we do. And I guess that's a conscious decision, um, not just like to waste money, uh, but to spend more money specifically on that customer service branch. Um, and that's always how I'd have it. The idea of automated systems, unless there's no way a, a human being can be around then, like if they were going to hit an answering machine at midnight anyway, you might as well have an automated system in place so that they can make some kind of progress, even if it's halting. Um, but other than that, I think it's always worth the extra money to have in-person contact. Um, that's just partly, uh, like, that's not backed up by any stats or facts. Um, that's just me living in this world and saying as a human being, like, that feels more right to me when you can provide it. Um, parables and examples instead of policies for teaching. Uh, that goes back into how you make rules and things like that. And this is the last thing that I have to say on setting up your front line. Um, and probably the most um, important to me, which is, don't lay out rules, like don't lay out guidelines for people, lay out stories, um, show examples. Like when someone does something right customer service wise and you're stoked with it, reproduce that and type it out for the rest of the company to see. Um, once again, the more rules you put in place, the more uh, kind of backlash you get and the worse customer service you get. But the more stories you put in place and the more examples of really good customer service, the more excited your own employees get to be able to uh, keep perpetuating that. And the more they're like, the more you also show them without you know, it's a show not tell thing. You're not telling them how to act, you're actually showing them and saying, look, a customer came in, they said this, I did this, bam. And the more examples you get of that, they get to see the diversity, they get to see it's not a script, but they get to see the patterns underlying all of those. And then they're more able to make their own decisions on the fly as well. Um, the last thing I'll talk about here is follow-up. And I'm only gonna talk a little bit about this because I think it's really up to, I think this is sort of the most creative th uh, part of the, um, of the process. And it's also the most neglected as well, uh, and to me is absolutely critical. So follow-up is just checking in with someone after they've already bought your service or your product, and just saying like, how's it treating you, right? Or saying, do you need anything else? Uh, even after a year, you know, if you buy a product that you know that someone should be using after a year, check in after a year and see how it's going for them. Uh, and we forget about this because it does take time, and theoretically they've already bought our product. Um, so unless we have a huge line and accessories and different things, or if we offer something that someone can do over and over again, they're not going to come back. They can still recommend friends. There's a lot of ways that people, once again, customer service is hopefully an advertising revenue for you as well. Um, but it's so ignored. Like, as soon as we get people's money, or as a business we get people's money, uh, I mean, that's it. The transaction is done. You know what I mean? You provided a good or service for money. Um, which also means that that's the best time to do something awesome. Uh, because whenever you don't have to do it, then it carries more weight. Uh, so the fact that you don't have to check in with someone after a year to see how their baby stroller is treating them, <laughs> um, but you do, says a lot. Uh, and there's a lot of ways to do that. Um, you can even check in and give them free things, or you can check in if you know that they're not using or they are using your service. 
You can give them personal phone calls. You can send them emails. Um, what I would say is sending a survey is not actually checking in. Like a satisfaction survey after the fact is not what I mean by this. Um, because that is just setting up an automated system that you have to pay no attention to that does itself. Like that's, not, that's providing value for you, not actually for them. Um, that goes back into the uh, uh, listen to complaints category. Like having feedback things is great so you can get that feedback, but that is not actually follow up. Follow up is a personal phone call or it's um, yeah, even a personal email, or it's sending them something else, saying like after a year we find some of these wheels break down. Here's another little set of wheels, like just in case you're running into that problem. Uh, stuff like that goes a long way too, and they're like, there's no reason that person should have remembered me. Uh, but they did, and that makes a difference. And so, uh, I mean, yeah, like we, we're just about to, we, I keep meaning to do this, it's actually really bad. Um, you get, so this is an example of getting carried away with business and not being able to implement all the crazy ideas you have. Um, but for a while, I've been wanting to call people after our floats, like two days afterwards, just to see um, how it's treating them, especially people who we've had good conversations with. Um, and I, yeah, we just haven't so far implemented that one. Um, but I'm really excited to. And when I do, I think it'll be awesome. So that's just a little kick in the butt now that I have this on recording to like actually implement that policy. OK. Um, yeah, right. Um, Several check-ins can also be good, um, is the other part of that. It really depends on how long they, that you plan on having them use your service. Uh, veterinarians are great at this. Uh, they will send you dentists, too, are really good at it. Uh, but that's because you have a regular checkup thing, so you don't treat it as like this kind of thing. You're like, oh, you're trying to get business from me. Um, but really, there's no reason to send a type of dentist check-in, but just for the hell of it, um, to different customers as well. Say. Um, you know, big purchases like a car or something like that, um, people are going to be using for a while, even like a backpack, um, which isn't as big a purchase, but people use backpacks for a long time. These sandals last me an average of three years. I just got a new pair, um, and I wear them every day until the weather doesn't permit. Um, but I've never gotten a letter from Rainbow Sandals saying like, hey, how are your sandals holding up? Um, they do, however, have an awesome um, policy that if you uh, wear through any part of this, uh, they will just send you a replacement sandal. Um, no questions asked yet. Um, so if you were, yeah, wear through any three layers of these before you wear through like one of the other parts of the layer, yeah, free sandal, um, which is awesome. So that's good customer service in that respect. Um, it's just a passive one as opposed to an active one. Um, ah, and that's another really, uh, yeah, 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 I saved the best for last. I forgot about that. Um, this is a, this is like a little business hacky thing that I really love, which is, um, once you get feedback and once you have that feedback cycle going and you're actually checking in with clients to see what they recommend or what you think you could improve about your business, um, keep a log of that and keep who recommended what. And when you just happen to change anything, like because you wanted to do it anyway, because most of the suggestions you get you've already thought of and you just haven't had time to implement anyway, you know what I mean? Um, but when you do finally change that thing, send everyone who made that suggestion a personal email and say like, hey, thank you so much for your suggestion. Just letting you know we changed this and like we're really glad you brought that to our attention and now it's different. Um, which is awesome. And people love that. They're like, you literally changed your business because of my suggestion? You're like, yes. <laughs> because of suggestions from people like you. Um, that's not what you say. That's not what you say. <laughs> um, but that, yeah, that's actually one of my favorite things to do is to check back in and let them know that their feedback actually had an impact on how our business is operating. Um, and so just to kind of sum everything up uh, as the, uh, the end of this little presentation, be magically human, listen to complaints, go the extra mile, set up your front line, and follow up. And those are the five categories I came up with. And uh, once again, the middle ground is the most dangerous place that you can be. Uh, and I mean, I guess being a terrible, terrible business is the most dangerous place you can be. <laughs> but for, for most of us that are running businesses, the middle ground is the most dangerous place to be. Uh, and so push it out of that go to the extreme, do incredible things, and let that whole social loop actually carry you forward and let people tell your story about how awesome you are. Thank you so much. And we'll come back. Uh, let's take a little 10-minute break. Um, we'll come back and do a workshop portion of this and uh, hopefully workshop some customer service for one of your guys' businesses. So think about uh, if there's anyone who wants to, do you want to do a quick question? come up ahead of time. Oh, yeah, you got one? Yeah. So I have a question here about uh, live chat services on websites. Do you know anybody who has had experience with those? Is it worth it? Do the customers actually use it? Um, yeah, yeah. So I've talked to a few people who have used those slash yeah. listen to interviews. Um, the, the best recommendation I have for those and what I've heard is they are awesome if you answer your chat really quick slash have people like staff there. 
Um, if all they see is live chat, no one currently online, or they see live chat and you go to talk to them and it takes five minutes to get a response, or you don't get any response at all, what that says is, like, we had a good idea, but we're not actually that organized as a business, so we're really dropping the ball on this. Um, so yeah, as long as it actually works, and as long as you can get back to them timely, and the people who are answering that um, aren't an automated service, like, um, there's a lot of... Uh, free services you can get just to set up uh, that chat within your website. Um, but there's also services that will actually provide the people who man the other end of that chat as well and answer people's um, technical problems, just like having call centers. Uh, and I would say that is much less effective. If you actually have one of your employees or you're just sitting at the computer doing background work anyway and you turn on your little like chat assistants and your customers can contact you, that's awesome. And from what I've heard, it actually makes, especially in like software um, type things, makes it seem much more personal and really helps out. Yeah. The one thing that Apple does that I really like is that for their customer service and their Apple Care is that you can schedule your live chat. Mm -hmm. So it's a really nice feature where it's like you just go on and they might have, you know, hey, at such and such time, you know, next available appointment. So you get some sort of little structural calendar on there. And you can go and say, yeah, 3 o'clock, perfect. You know, that's the kids are taking a nap or whatever. And then you can get on and so you know, and they, they're always like exactly on time like an alarm. So that way, it's an easier way to do the live chat without someone just sitting in the, in mm -hmm. the ether waiting for it. You know? Totally, totally. Um, and definitely even when you get to yeah, size like Apple, I'm pretty sure that, that sort of thing is like well, unnecessary. If, if yeah. you're a small business owner and you're interested in doing live chat as a feature of or addressing technical oh, issues right. and things like that, you know, if they, if you basically scheduled one, so that they didn't have to come in, like, yeah, yeah. it's a feature that you could offer them. It's like, all right, you know, I can do my live chats after 3 o'clock, or we can do one at 3.30. Then you can address a small a concern in a small business forum without having a permanent employee dealing with live chat. Yeah, that's very true. That's actually a really good point. Um, I like, too, that it sets expectations correctly, um, which is part of that, yeah, don't make sales promises you can't keep. Like, if you're like, oh, instant chat available online, <laughs> and, like, they're never online, that's terrible. Um, if you, yeah, go and it says, like, scheduled, you know, chat appointment, that is much more realistic. Yeah, I like that. Um, I just have a general comment to you on the other part. Um, another thing that I think is uh, helpful is if you do need to make like policies or handle situations that keep coming up all the time, um, trying to make them like intelligently um, so that they're not affecting like people that they don't need to affect, um, which are like I think our cancellation policy that we have uh, is like a good setup for that. Like um, to deal with people who just keep canceling last minute, we just kind of have like a record <coughs> keep per person. So if like, they cancel on us once, we just kind of be like, hey, you know, we usually have this policy, but we'll let it slide this time. Don't even worry about it. And if they, they cancel again, we're like, hey, you know, like, don't worry, but we might need to take like, prepayment from you next time. And we just kind of have like an individual one-on-one -on -one basis for like how we handle people who keep canceling on us over and over again. Um, and that way, like, not every person, even if something like legitimately came up and they were kind of canceling last minute once, has to deal with like this kind of wall of a policy that we put up to handle like weird situations. Yeah, like it's that. true. Yeah, our full actual cancellation policy is um, say that we have 24 hour cancellation policy, never enforce it. Um, if people call to cancel and say we're letting them off the hook this time, yeah, and then um, after the first time, implement that maybe next time you'll do a prepayment, and then if they cancel twice, actually implement prepayment. And it's like, yeah, the most unintrusive system for anyone who's just normally going along through everything is possible. The only thing that gets added on is that we're like, oh, we have a 24-hour cancellation policy as part of our plan. Um, but we've never charged anyone for that. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> um, good point. Yeah, that's really good. Um, any other questions or any, uh, any comments before we go off? We'll, we'll do a little Q&A when we get back if there's anything there. Like I said, um, customer service is one of those things where fortunately there is actually a lot of good information and good advice. And I feel like intuitively we actually know how to do it. Um, and another one of the points of this, just for anyone who's watching it in the future too, is just to like give you permission to be awesome and be human. Um, and I feel like too often we get caught up in this business advice that we hear and we think we need to be businessy. And yeah, just a reminder, no, absolutely not. Go back to being your awesome human selves. And, All right. Uh, I'll just wrap up with saying if you want a collection of stories on how to be over the top and awesome, uh, Gary Vaynerchuk, who's well known for taking customer service to the internet and being over the top. He, his recent book, The Thank You Economy, tells you pretty much how to be awesome in the digital age and be proactive with your customer service and wowing them before they even really buy from you. So that's what, just a recommendation, a really good book I read. Awesome. Now we'll be back in about five minutes. Ten? Ten? Yeah, what ten. time is it? I think we have ten. All right. Yeah, we got ten.